Now, um, I just want to end by referring back to a topic which has come up a couple of times today. I call it the shifting moral zeitgeist. Uh, it came up, I think, in the exchange between Susan Neyman and Paul Churchland, and I think others have talked about the uh, apparent improvement in our moral um, outlook that seems to have seems to be a general trend in history. I want to read a few illustrations of this. I, it came up also in, with, with respect to changing attitudes to racism and uh, um, sexism and slavery. Thomas Henry Huxley, in his own time, was uh, in the vanguard of enlightened and liberal progressive thought. But that was in his time, and his time is not ours. And in 1871, Huxley wrote the following. No rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. And if this be true, it is simply incredible that, when all his disabilities are removed, and our prognathous relative has a fair field and no favor, as well as no oppressor, he will be able to compete successfully with his bigger-brained and smaller-jawed rival in a contest which is to be carried on by thoughts and not by bites. The highest places in the hierarchy of civilization will assuredly not be within the reach of our dusky cousins. Well, historians, uh, it's commonplace that good historians don't judge statements from the past by the standards of their own time. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Abraham Lincoln, too, uh, like Huxley, was ahead of his time. But his views on matters of race also sound equally backward to us. Here he is in 1858. I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. My point is that if Huxley and Lincoln had been born and educated in our time, they would have been the first to cringe with the rest of us at their own Victorian sentiments and unctuous tone. I quote them to illustrate how the moral zeitgeist moves on, even in such a short time. There are numerous other examples. Um, as recently as the 1960s, the swinging 60s, which were legendary for their liberal modernity. But at the beginning of the 1960s, the prosecuting barrister in the trial for obscenity of Lady Chatterley's lover asked the jury, would you approve of your young sons, young daughters, because girls can read as well as boys, <laughs> reading this book? Is it a book you would have lying around in your own house? Is it a book you would even wish your wife or your servants to read? A stunning illustration of the speed with which the zeitgeist changes. The current American invasion of Iraq is widely condemned for its civilian casualties. But those casualty figures are orders of magnitude lower than comparable figures for the Second World War. There's a steadily shifting standard of what's morally acceptable. <coughs> Donald Rumsfeld today may sound callous and odious, but in the time of the Second World War, he would have sounded like a bleeding heart liberal compared to uh, Bomber Harris, the British Air Marshal responsible for the flattening of Dresden, for example. Something has shifted in the intervening decades, and it's shifted in all of us. The shift has no connection with religion. If anything, it happens in spite of religion, not because of it. Even Adolf Hitler, widely regarded as pushing the envelope of evil into uncharted territory, would not have stood out in the time of, say, Genghis Khan. He, Hitler killed more people than Genghis Khan, but he had modern technology at his disposal. 
even Hitler, I suspect, would not have said that he gained his greatest pleasure, as Genghis Khan did, from seeing his, his victims near and dear bathed in tears. We judge Hitler's degree of evil by the standards of today, and the moral zeitgeist has moved on since the time of Genghis Khan. Hitler seems especially evil only by the standards of our own time. In a previous book, I've quoted H.G. Wells's Utopian New Republic, and I do it again. It's a shocking illustration, especially when you remember that H.G. Wells, at the, around the turn of the century, around 1902, was regarded as a liberal progressive. Wells wrote the following. And how will the New Republic treat the inferior races? How will it deal with the black, the yellow man, the Jew, those swarms of black and brown and dirty white and yellow people who do not come into the new needs of efficiency? Well, the world is a world and not a charitable institution, and I take it they will have to go. And the ethical system of these men of the New Republic, the ethical system which will dominate the world state, will be shaped primarily to favor the procreation of what is fine and efficient and beautiful in humanity, beautiful and strong bodies, clear and powerful minds. And the method that nature has followed hitherto in the shaping of the world, whereby weakness was prevented from propagating weakness, is death. The men of the New Republic will have an ideal that will make the killing worth the while. And as I say, Wells was regarded as a progressive in his own time. In 1902, such sentiments would not have been widely agreed, but you could have had a dinner party argument about them. Modern readers, by contrast, literally gasp with horror when they read those words. And we're forced to realize that even Hitler, appalling though he was, was not quite as far outside the zeitgeist of his time as he seems from our, vant our vantage point a mere half century later. How swiftly the zeitgeist changes. And it seems to move in parallel on a broad front throughout the world. Where have these changes come from? I've suggested that they originate in some Darwinian sense, from a sort of misfiring of primitive urges towards, um, towards altruism. But where do these changes come from, the shifting moral zeitgeist? Well, I don't think the onus is on me to answer that, although I tried in my book, In, in the God Delusion. But I do think uh, it's, uh, it, it is important to stress that they certainly don't come from religion, um, insofar as uh, people think that they get their moral standards, moral values from scripture, it's perfectly clear, and many people have made this point, that they do it by cherry picking. They go through the Bible picking out those verses that conform to the current standard of morality as the, the position that it's reached in the shifting moral zeitgeist. And they reject those verses, which in the case of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Exodus, etc., is most of them. They reject those. But in order to do that cherry picking, in order to do that selection and rejecting of nice verses versus nasty verses, they have to have a standard. And that standard is available to all of us, whether we're religious or not. And the, the shifting moral zeitgeist is a particularly telling illustration of how indeed it is available to all of us. It even shifts in parallel in all of us, whether we are uh, religious or not. So I don't know what causes it. I've got, I've got ideas. We could, talk, we could talk about it. I think it's a kind of um, composite of um, just plain ordinary conversations among people, dinner party conversations, newspaper editorials, legal decisions, uh, congressional votes. Uh, these, are, these all feed into the, 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 the shift that's, that takes place from decade to decade to decade. Um, and, but the main point I'm making is that wherever else our moral values come from, they certainly don't come from religion. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So a, a kinder, gentler Richard Dawkins. 